Do not let your emotions override your judgment. Welcome to Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy. Captains Marvel and America are very similar movies, but for my money, First Avenger is the better film because it does a much better job establishing character. After watching this movie, you know exactly who Steve Rogers is and his character remains consistent across the next six films. But as for Captain Marvel, we don't really get to know that much about her. She cracks wise, she does what's right, and she's really powerful. That makes her hard to distinguish her from almost every other hero in the MCU. And I think you can boil these problems down to one scene that shows why one is this, and the other movie is this. Hello? Did someone just join? I, I heard a beep. Did we all hear the beep? Yeah, this is we all heard the beep on our end if anyone's there. But first, let me explain the movie similarities. Each film is set in the MCU's past and establishes a character who will play an important role in a team-up film. The hero is a soldier who is part of a close-knit military unit. They lose a mentor in the same scene where they gain superpowers. They're guided along the way by an older government employee and receive help from a genius scientist. Was that so difficult to figure out? I mean, you're my science guy. They are each controlled by their governments, but after breaking away, they alter their uniforms. The hero breaks into a research facility and discovers information that will help them defeat the enemy. They also rescue a future ally from this facility. Who's a good kitty, huh? Huh, Goose? The Tesseract is the MacGuffin in each film that powers the powerful device that the villain covets. Eventually, one of the villains switches sides and joins the heroes. The climactic battle features the hero destroying enemy ships, and the final fight also takes place on a ship after the hero is captured. Each film ends with the hero disappearing until the present day, and Nick Fury sets up their return for a future film. All right, those are the similarities. Now let's talk about the scenes that I think really separate these movies and that's the scenes where we meet the main character. Steve is first introduced trying to enlist in the military. Now this is a quick scene and it briskly teaches us a few facts about the hero. He wants to fight, he's physically weak, and he has no living family. And this all takes about 45, 50 seconds, but the next scene establishes the entire Captain America franchise in just a minute and a half. In the movie theater, a newsreel tells us that the war is not going well for the allies and shows us that even kids can help the war effort. And by the way, have you ever noticed how often the MCU uses TV news to convey information? It happens a lot, even in Guardians of the Galaxy. Anyways, some jerk face is yelling and Steve tells him to shut his yapper. Telling someone in a movie theater to shut up has already made Steve the greatest hero in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Now notice how the newsreel narration actually lines up with the jerk face standing up here. Together with allied forces, we'll face any threat, no matter the size. And then, the alley. The scene that teaches us who Steve Rogers really is. Steve is going to lose this fight. He's weak, and this guy's big, but he won't stay down. He's the cool hand Luke of superheroes. This teaches us that he's brave. Now he doesn't reach for a pipe or a brick to hit the bully with. He uses a trash can lid as a shield. Now yes, this foreshadows why he picks his signature weapon later in the movie, but it also shows us his worldview. Steve is a protector. Even decades later in Infinity War, he insists on protecting the Vision's life. We don't trade lives, Vision. And then the first dialogue in this scene. You just don't know when to give up, do you? You gonna do this all day. And there it is, Cap's catchphrase, what he would say if he had a pull string in his back. I can do this all day. Yeah, I know. This teaches us that he won't back down in the face of overwhelming odds, a character trait that would define his arc in Civil War. I can do this all day. And then, just when all is lost and he's beaten, Bucky shows up to save the day. Pick on somebody your own size. This establishes the friendship that will drive Steve's story through all of his solo films. In just a few seconds, we know who Steve Rogers is and have a hint about where he's going to go. The entire franchise is elegantly established with a few lines of dialogue. So now, let's talk about Captain Marvel. Before I saw Captain Marvel, I thought, man, this movie can't miss. It's in the MCU, it has a top-notch cast, a great creative team, and a cat. But for me, the movie was a big disappointment. And it failed, in part, because it did a lousy job of showing us who Carol Danvers is. So what do I mean by that? For most of the film, she has amnesia, and this makes her listless and easily controlled. What was given can be taken away. Now this is an interesting storytelling challenge. How do we get to know a character who knows nothing about herself? We talked about Steve Rogers' introduction, so now let's look at Carol's and how it highlights the film's major flaws. Wanna fight? 
Like Steve, Carol is introduced with a fight and we also don't see the first punch. But this sparring session is the first of many wasted opportunities to define her character. On paper, a sparring session is a great way to convey information to the audience. We can learn their skill set, how they behave under pressure, and define their relationship to their sparring partner. <laughs> I slipped. Right, you slipped as a result of me punching you in the face. Notice how the scene begins with the characters describing something that we don't get to see. It just happened off camera. This keeps happening all through the movie. The characters are constantly telling us information when the movie should be showing us. You struggle with your emotions. All through the movie, Jan Rog is warning Carol about her emotions. Control your impulses. Do not let your emotions override your judgment. So he's telling the audience that she has a problem controlling her emotions. But does she? The film really tries to sell this idea that the Kree are cold and humans act emotionally. Went with his gut against the orders, but it's what keeps us human. I get in trouble for that. But Carol doesn't get in trouble for that. I mean, they say that she does, but we don't really get to see her act emotional or get into trouble. Now, at the end of the sparring session, she briefly loses control and uses her powers on Jude Law. But the moment's treated like, ah, uh, oopsie, and not a serious mistake with far-reaching consequences. She's not really in trouble. Jude Law isn't hurt. It's more of a cartoon injury because he's okie-dokie in the next scene. If this outburst had been taken a little more seriously, then she'd feel bad. We'd see that she has a temper and the consequences of losing that temper. Then the Supreme Intelligence would give her a stern talking to before putting her on Yon Rog's team. But instead, the talk with the Supreme Intelligence is a boring info dump. We've given you a great gift, the chance to fight for the good of all Kree. Then there's another missed opportunity on Torfa, which really should have been the movie's opening sequence. Their contact is hidden behind enemy lines, and Veers wants to impulsively rush into action. But Jude Law orders her to stand down. With me, I'll go alone. No, you won't. And she obeys, instead of rushing into combat to save a life. You know, acting emotionally. This scene could have let her real personality shine through. If she's rebellious, compassionate, and hot-headed, then she would have charged into battle to save one of the other soldiers, and she could have been captured that way. But instead, she's just another soldier who follows orders. Because she's never given a chance to show her emotions, she comes off bland. All we know is that she has power, she's a soldier for the Kree, and Jude Law is her boss. I want to serve. But you know where the movie does way too much telling instead of showing? When Veers meets Maria. Smart and funny and a huge pain in the ass. Her monologue to Carol about who she is is great, it's well delivered, and utterly meaningless because we're only just being told things about Carol instead of experiencing them. Later in the movie, when Carol regains her memory, the scene still lacks the punch it should have had because we're still being told who she is through short flashback clips. Carol Danvers doesn't get a scene where she gets to act like Carol Danvers until the end of the movie when she tells Jan Rog, I have nothing to prove to you. And that is a cool moment, but it's robbed of meaning because their relationship never comes into focus in the film. She never tries to win his approval or thanks him for being a mentor. He gives her orders and she listens. That's the extent of their relationship. Now this got me wondering, why structure the movie this way? Why do we have to find out about Carol's past at the same time she does? After all, we already know that she's a human from reading the comics. So why try to create a shocking reveal that she's a Kree? So here's how I would address the movie's problem. Remember when Maria tells Carol about the last day she saw her alive? She was trying to take the aces up herself, but you said if that- If there were lives at stake, I would fly the plane. Yeah. How about we actually get to see that scene? In fact, let's tell this story in chronological order. Instead of making this movie like The Bourne Identity, let's make it RoboCop. In that movie, Murphy is an ordinary police officer. He's injured, he becomes RoboCop, and slowly has to regain his memory. So, in our revised Captain Marvel, we begin with Carol and Maria in the bar singing Sweet Child of Mine on karaoke. Then that jerk pilot starts up with them saying, girls can't fly, that's why they call it a cockpit. And Marvell is there, and she tries to calm down the situation. But then the guy insults Marvell, and Carol decks him in the jaw. But this guy happens to be a superior officer, and now she's going to lose her wings. The next morning, Marvell wakes Carol up. She tells her, we need to do an emergency test flight. Lives are at stake. And screw it, Carol's going to be court-martialed anyways. Then events unfold just like they do in the movie. But when the spaceship shows up, it's a big moment, because up until now, events have been very grounded and normal. After Jan Rog kills Marvell, Carol destroys the drive, and we cut to black. Then we cut to six years later, and now she's working for the guy who killed her mentor. Not only that, but she's dying to win his approval and apologizes when her temper flares up. She's been brainwashed, and now she's totally kowtowing to this a-hole. 
This is the messed up situation that too many women are in all around the world. They're stuck in an abusive relationship with a man so controlling, they actually apologize for having feelings when they inconvenience him. And now every step of the movie has more weight. We're desperate for Carol to leave this guy. We want her to break free. We're rooting for her to wake up and leave her abuser. Every time Carol puts together a piece of her past, it brings her one step closer to becoming herself again, the Carol that we already know from the first scene of the film. This change would eliminate the surprise that Carol was a human, but it would create suspense and make us wonder when she was finally going to break free. So when she regains her memories and realizes that she, not Jan Rog, controls her powers, the audience would feel elated and relieved. Finally, Carol is back. Now she can destroy ships and go be the Skrull Moses. So for me, that's the big difference between these movies. But what did you think of Captain Marvel? Which movie do you think is better? Let me know in the comments below. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.